peeking through the behind the curtains to see what they're doing, those strange people who are different from us. How many of us have had the experience that you have maybe a neighbor or someone in your neighborhood who appears initially to be different from you? Maybe they're from a different country. Maybe they've got a different vote for somebody sign outside their house. That alone can create being very different from me. Maybe they're um, maybe they're um, drive a different kind of car. And then something happens. Maybe there's some I don't know what it is. Some something happens that causes you to actually walk across the street and meet those people. And you sit down together and you discover that they're not nearly as different from you as you thought. Who's had that experience okay, when you actually meet? Who's had that across political boundaries? That you, you, you have one political belief and you meet someone from another who has a strongly different political belief, but when you actually get to meet, you realize it's the same awareness just channeling in a slightly different direction. Not so many hands went up for that one. <laughs> and that's going a little far. Now, wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. So now let's extrapolate what happens with different parts of the country, you know? different geographical areas. When you meet somebody from Texas, or even just to go a little beyond, meet somebody from Mexico or from Canada. And now we have a very strong feeling they're different from me. Different in their language, well, only mildly different than Canadians, of course, but different in their. We're going out, we're going out for the evening. You're <laughs> Canadian? <laughs> you're not at home right now, are you? No, because you, you, you're not home now because you decided to go. Yeah, we're Americans now. <laughs> decided to go out for the evening. Yeah. So, um, and then of course, you know, if, we, if especially a country like we're in right now, the United States of America, which is bordered by these huge oceans, it's very tempting to look across, well, you can't really actually see anything to look across, but to imagine yourself looking across the Atlantic Ocean, and then everybody on the other side just merges into one homogenous group of not like us. Whether they're French or Iraqi or Afghani, it doesn't really matter, they're not like us. And that, of course, collectively then becomes the justification for warfare. Because warfare really becomes the conflict now, not between people in a family or families in a neighborhood, but between groups of people who feel threatened by another group of people who are not like us. Not like us in their beliefs, not like us in their diet, not like us in their religion. But all of this begins with the feeling of separation, doesn't it? All of this begins with the unquestioned assumption that the source of thought, the source of fear, that which is experiencing this moment is different in me than it is in the other. You see what I mean? And we enact that at all different levels. That way of experiencing reality also affects the way that we deal with our planet. At this point, I'm feeling a little bit hypocritical to be drinking my water from a plastic bottle. <laughs> Please excuse me, uh, and uh, I will bring a refillable container next time. But you see, the way that we treat our planet is also generated out of the feeling of separation. Isn't it? The feeling that me and the planet are separate. And just like in a marriage, if you feel separate from your partner, your marriage is going to become a negotiation. How can I get my needs met in exchange for me fulfilling your needs? So in the same way, our relationship to the planet becomes one of acquisition. How can I get what I need from the earth? And maybe give back what I need in some way, but it's a, it's a transaction. These days, more and more people in huge numbers now, all over the world, are awakening in exactly the same way as you bore testimony tonight. As I said, when I started teaching, there were people coming 
week after week who were not having this kind of direct realization. Yes. Maybe then I would teach a, a one-week course, a one-week intensive, and bless you again. And sometime towards the end of a one-week course, somebody would have a huge firework and say, wow, there's nobody here. Oh. But two days later, back in the doghouse. You know? But today, it's possible to walk into a room like this to invite the audience, please close your eyes. You can hear the sounds, right? Just take the attention back and check who is hearing the sounds. It's possible within 10 minutes, all over the planet now, to share in our mutual recognition of being nobody and everything at the same time, of being presence, of being love. And it's possible very quickly, very easily to recognize that in each other. There is a phrase used in the 12-step recovery movement called bottoming out. You know that phrase? Who's, who's heard that phrase before? Bottoming out? What it means is, um, if someone is in addiction to a substance that is damaging their life, alcohol, drugs, uh, <laughs> 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 If someone is an addiction to a substance that is harming their life, when they are in the throes of that addiction, the most common thing to happen is that their life is being damaged, but their perception of that is one of denial, exactly, denial, which is not just a river in Africa. <laughs> It means that the drinking has a negative effect on marriage, on the children, on work, on health, but we don't want to face that. How many of us have had someone close to us in addiction and they were in denial? People who are really experts in addiction, people who guide people in recovery, would say that in that phase there is very little you can do to help the person. They're going to be very defensive if you try and even suggest to them they have an addiction. But people in addiction, they will generally go into a phase called bottoming out, which means there's a point where, you, where your life is disrupted enough that you just can't deny it anymore. That means if it's a man who's drinking, his wife leaves with the kids. He loses his job. He loses his driver's license. Yeah? He loses his home. And there's a point where you just can't deny it anymore. You bottom out. You are faced with your misery. From the subjective experience of the addict, that is the worst time in the cycle of addiction. That's where you just feel like you want to kill yourself. It feels like hell. But from the perspective of somebody supporting recovery, that is the best time. That is the best time. Now there is an opportunity not that you've gone, your life's gone down, 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 and you hit bottom. No, your life's gone down, 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 and you hit bottom, and bam, you can snap right out of that pattern of addiction and snap right into a higher level of integration. 